does your depression stem from? That was a post by my friend on Facebook that really got me thinking. Sad part is when I was reading it, I was walking in Westlands. So that question really disturbed me until it hit me. And I was like, so I'll take you back to actually where it started. So I used to work with a certain theatre company and I had made a lot of friends while we're doing our theatre shows. And at that time I was 22 and I was uh, living out my artistic expression. So I was performing poetry, I was writing a lot, I was acting on stage, I also had a stint on some TV shows that I'm not going to mention. I was an extra, you probably didn't see me, which is fine. But I was really living out this artistic side of myself. Things at home started being rocky, mostly because of my poetry. So my dad had issues with the fact that all these shows were happening at night. So one time, I decided that, ah, this guy doesn't know me. Me, I leave this house of his. You know when you're told, come on, ataka kujo usiku, enda kwako. Or you'll come at uh, late at night when you have your own house. So I was like, me, I want to go have my own house that I can come as late as I want. But with what money? Because poetry does not pay, <laughs> okay? So I was like, you know what, I'll save, and then I'm going to have my own place, and I can come at whatever time. So <laughs> went back to theater. Then my friend, I had a friend from high school. She used to live in Naivasha. So one time she hits me up. I was like, hey, are you in town? We have a play. So she said, yeah, yeah, I can come through. She came for the play. Then she was staying with her brother. Then when she was going back, I was like, can I come with you? Because I like exploring and I would like to come visit. So she was like, yeah, yeah, we can go. But I'm leaving on Friday. So I was like, Sawa, I'll panga myself. We can leave on Friday. So this Friday, my friend um, is not picking calls. And then she's sending texts. She's like, oh, no, no, I'm just waiting for something. Um, just give me a minute. We'll go. So mimi nisha pack bag, nisha ambiatu kwa heri, naenda kutembea. And then I'm waiting. I waited in town. I'm a very patient person. So ukiniambia tu, ndakuja tu. After two, it's three, it's five, it's six. But she said she's still coming. So me, I'm trusting that my friend is coming. Until it was about 10 p.m. when she finally said, oh, no, I'm sorry, I don't think I'll make it. Can we go on Sunday? I said, oh, actually, I was waiting for you in town, but I guess it's okay. So at this point, I didn't want to go home because my sister had already told me my dad was back. And I knew going back to the house means having to start explaining where you're coming from at 11 p.m., and I was not about to have any of that because I was like an independent woman and all. So I called up another friend. I was like, hey, can I bank at your place? So my friend was like, yeah, sure. Um, you can come through. So I was like, ah, good friends save lives. Went to Koja, took a matatu to Wangige. And then it was like a distance from where you get off. You have to walk. So my friend was kind enough, I can kujia kwa stage, to katembea, to kipiga story, went to the house. I was like, have you eaten? I was like, uh, actually, no. So I was like, ah, cool. To look out to me, gali, have some. Next day is a Saturday. So I'm calling my friend. I'm like, okay, so what's up? Are we going? What's happening? So she's like, no, no, let's just do Sunday, because Sunday works best for me. So I was like, ah, cool. So I asked my friend, can I stay an extra night, and then I can leave tomorrow morning? My friend was like, yeah, sure. My friend was roommates with another mutual friend who I had not really gotten to know much, but I knew him. So that Saturday, we chilled, watched movies, talked, uh, even thought of a script we could work on. And then evening came when I started receiving random suggestive text messages from the roommates. So he started texting. It's like, hey, you better prepare yourself. So I was just like, huh? It's like, ah, no, see, I'm coming. And then he said, I'm coming with my boys. So I didn't think much of it until my friend told me, so 
uh, so-and-so is coming with his friends, so today you can't sleep on the couch. If you're comfortable, we can share my bed, just separate sides. I was like, okay, sour. Then, at around 11 p.m., 11, almost midnight, this friend came with his other friends, and they started playing music, they were eating, they were just, you know, laughing. And then randomly, my friend decides to leave the room. He didn't tell me why, he just left. The next thing I know is the roommate was in the room, and he locked the door. So he was like, so are you ready? I was confused because I had not given any implication that anything was going to happen between us. So I was like, okay, you're drunk. Uh, can we talk in the morning? And he proceeded and raped me. So the next morning, actually after he finished, he walked out and went to continue merrymaking with his friends. Then my friend came back into the room, got into the bed, and faced the wall. After they finished merrymaking, I went and sat in the sofa, because they went to the roommate's room, this guy's room. I went and sat there with a blanket and waited for morning, because there's nowhere I would be able to go. So the next morning, I called up my friend, and suddenly our trip was not happening. So I called up another friend. At this point, she used to work in Mombasa. I asked her, can I, can I come? So my friend said, sour. So I was like, okay, now let me make sure I have enough money for transport to take me to the coast. So I started calling a couple of people. Then I asked a friend of mine if she could meet me in town. So I left Wangige. Before even I left, I remember the reason I decided to even call my friend was when I was seated there, after they woke up, they started talking and this roommate even had the nerve to say, Anezenda Sasa, we're not looking for a housewife. So I met my friend in town, and I proceeded to tell her what had happened. And the first thing she said, she was like, but come on with our protection, is it really rape? So I started doubting what had happened. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess not, because at least he cared enough to make sure that I wouldn't get sick or pregnant or all those other things. That was the last time I ever spoke about that for five years. So from that point, I went to the coast, and I went to the coast. My friend was there, like she was working over the weekends. She would party. I didn't tell her anything. We chilled, but there was something. So I started drinking. To this point, I had only ever tasted reds once. I had one can, I got tipsy, and I was like, yeah, alcohol is not for me. But at the cost, every last coin I had went into buying vodka or whiskey, and not even like the good kind, just something. I remember I was there for six days, and it was all a blur. I can't tell you what my experience was. I can't tell you if we even went to a beach. I just know we went to a party. This party we went to, guys were drinking, there were drugs, there's all this stuff happening. I drank and I passed out on a sofa. And this guy, I remember waking up because someone was hitting me. And this guy was slapping my forehead. 
And I was like, okay, this can't be my life. So I said, I'll go back home. As much as there's that struggle with my father, I'd rather just be at home. But I never said anything. So I showed up home, put my bag aside, and got into a bed. So I grew up in Kawangware. We didn't have a big house. Um, we had a dabodeka bed in the kitchen, which was my sister's and mine. And then my brother came along. So it was my sister and myself and my brother. So I went, went to the top bank, and I don't know how long I was there, but I hid in my mother's house. And I would only leave the bed when I knew my dad was not around. And I would only do three things, eat, shower, use the bathroom, then go back up there. It was like I was living in darkness for such, I don't even know how long, I think it was at least a month, until I decided that it was time for me to move out. I had no money, I wasn't working at the time, so I called up my cousin who was a student at USIU and I was like, can I crash with you? And at that point, he was about to go on holiday, so he was like, yeah, the house will be empty. And that's how I ended up moving out of my mother's house. The drinking continued. I would have moments where anything, anytime anything wasn't going right in my life, I would just start drinking. And it wasn't that the drinking was making me happy or anything, I think it was just making me numb. And the one thing I didn't want to do in those moments was feel. I didn't want to feel my situation. I didn't want to feel that my work wasn't working out. So, At one point, I, I had been working at a certain company. This was in, 20, in 2015. In 2014, I'd been working for a certain company and I asked to leave because I felt like that environment wasn't good for me. So I went and asked my friends for a job in their company. And the day before I started, they had a screening at Blankets and Wine. So, I was told, oh, you can come, we have tickets, we are screening some short films, and you're welcome to join us. So I went for blankets. Our boss bought us a box of wine, so we started drinking. I drank. I don't even know how much I drank, but I drank until I broke down. I started crying. This is at a public event with my potential bosses, well, my new bosses, who I have not worked for yet, I know them, but I've not worked for them. And I broke down. I cried, and I don't know how it stopped. <laughs> I just cried, and I was talking about how messed up my life was. Nothing was working out the way I was hoping for it to work out. I felt like I was doing so much and getting so little in return. After I broke down, I was given a lift, went back home. <laughs> And I woke up the next morning, and I was just like, wow. My life really sucks. So I went to the office, and the first person I bumped into the office made a joke about my breakdown. And I was really, really sad that morning. So he made a joke, and I was like, that's, that's your takeaway. Someone can break down in front of you like that, and then you think, oh, this is funny. So I was like, cool. Then a friend of mine called Alex Ikawa, he was at the event with us. So he pulled me aside and told me I need to talk to you. So we went to the rooftop, and he proceeded to tell me um, how amazing he thought I was and all these things he thought about me. He told me that, he knew I was really good at my job. He understands that I was going through something, and if I ever needed him, he'd be there. So that was like a glimmer of hope, but I had someone, because at that point, I felt so alone. After about a year, at that point, actually, after the event, I decided to stop drinking. I said, I'm going to stop drinking, 
because I, I drink and I break down. <laughs> After one year, I had gotten into a relationship and things weren't working out. So in this relationship, things were not working out. And I felt stuck. I had just moved in with this person and they were doing all these things that were hurtful towards me. So I started drinking again and it got so bad because I don't like, I don't like the taste of alcohol. I like my alcohol sweet. So at one point I was so desperate that the only things that were in the house were alcohol and ice cream. And I thought it was a good idea to try and mix them. Horrible idea, never try it. And then I found some pills. So I was like, wouldn't it be cool to just, you know, stop feeling altogether? So I decided to take the pills with the alcohol and the ice cream. So I mixed up my pills in the ice cream tub. The next thing I know is I was being woken up in the shower with cold water running through my body. At that point, I gave up alcohol again. But from that point, any time anything would happen, I would be going through stuff. Like my work isn't working out. My relationship is not working out. I would just start drinking. So I decided to again call my friend Alex. And that day, I'd been given a contact for a therapist. So I asked her to come as well. And they were both there. And the one thing I remember from that conversation was them telling me that you can't get water from a rock. It was a metaphor about my situation, but I think at the same time, it's, it was a metaphor for me because I was trying to force things to work. I thought that if I do more of, say, something, then everything else will be fine. So I stopped drinking after that and I started going to therapy. And I have been working on myself since then. And then I stopped going to therapy at some point because money, but I'm back in therapy. <laughs> but I started drinking again around December 2019. And the reason I feel the need to mention this is because I went back, not because I was trying to fight something, not because I was trying to hide or to become numb. I didn't want alcohol to have defeated me. And I didn't want to never say, oh, I can't drink anymore because every time I am sad or every time I'm in a depressive mode, that's my go-to. The other thing I had taken up to doing was wearing red lipstick like today. It had become my armor. So I had realized that every time I would wear my lipstick, it looked so good that no one paid attention to the pain in my eyes. So I started wearing it every single day because when I didn't have it, people kept asking me what's wrong. So it became this shield that I would wear. And at some point I hated red lipstick because it reminded me that every time I wore it, it was because I was hiding something. And today I'm here wearing red lipstick, not because I'm hiding something, but because it looks really good on me. And it's definitely my color. Healing for me started when Alex pulled me aside what I had not realized was I had been drinking because I was trying to hide or not feel because I had not dealt with this situation. And honestly, I don't think you can ever deal with rape or everything that comes after that. But I can say that standing here, 
I stopped calling that person my rapist because I stopped owning him. Because every, every time I would talk, I would say, my rapist. And I realized I'm owning him. I can't own someone who did something like that to me. So that rapist, probably wherever he is, has no idea what he did to me. Or he does, and he doesn't care. Because around two years ago, he had the nerve to send me a message on Facebook. And that's when I realized that as much as I've been living with this, this person moved on with their life like nothing had happened. I have a circle of friends who have never been told this. This is my first time really talking about it. And I still can't talk about it without feeling but I know that I'm healing and I'm working on myself. And I've taken steps towards making sure that I'm okay. And that doesn't mean that I'll go back to being the person I was before it happened. It just means living with the scars it left behind. Thank you.